In the 1800s and the early 1900s, America was bombarded by a deadly virus known as the White Death, or tuberculosis. This disease was very terrifying and extremely contagious, and without a cure, it devastated entire families and communities. In 1900, Louisville was the perfect place for tuberculosis to breed and run rampant, being located on low swampland. In 1910, a hospital was built on a hill in southern Jefferson County and was designed to combat this deadly disease. However, the disease continued to ravage the region, and eventually they received enough donations and some land, and a new hospital was started in 1924. The new structure, called Waverly Hills, opened in 1926. It was the most advanced sanatorium for tuberculosis in the country, but most of the patients passed from the disease anyways. Lacking medicine and treatments, the patients were offered fresh air, rest, and plenty of nutritious food. Sadly, the hospital's main use was to isolate the sick from those that are not. Families were divided, with parents and children alike being forced into the hospital with little contact with loved ones. Often, the treatments for tuberculosis were as bad, if not worse, than the disease itself. Some of the experiments that were done in seeking a cure would be considered barbaric by today's standards, but others are now common. Patients' lungs were exposed to UV light in an attempt to stop the spread of the bacteria. This was done in sunrooms, where they used artificial light instead of sunlight, or on the roof or open porches. Since they believed fresh air was a possible cure, the patients were often put in front of huge windows or on the porches, even during the middle of winter. Old photos show patients lounging in chairs while covered in snow. Other treatments were less pleasant, but much bloodier. Doctors would surgically implant a balloon into the lungs and then fill them in an attempt to expand the lungs. This often had disastrous results, as well as an operation where muscles and ribs are removed from the patient's chest to expand further and allow more oxygen in. This bloody procedure was considered a last resort, and most patients didn't survive it. Patients that survived the disease and the treatments would leave out the front door. The ones that didn't were taken through what was called the body chute, or the death tunnel. It was an enclosed tunnel that led through the hospital to train tracks at the bottom of the hill. They used a motorized rail and cable system, and they would lower the bodies to waiting trains in secret. They kept it a secret so that the other patients wouldn't see how many were leaving dead. The doctors believed that the patient's mental health was just as important as their physical health. Many inaccurate reports are out there that state how many people died during Waverly Hill's decades of operations. Some state that tens of thousands died, but this is greatly exaggerated. A former assistant medical director at the hospital named Dr. J. Frank Stewart stated that the highest number of deaths to occur there in a single year was 152. Those numbers dropped as low as 42 in 1955. According to filed death certificates, approximately 6,000 people died there dating back to 1911. While a much smaller number than is bandied about, it's still a high number for a single structure. By the 1930s, tuberculosis started to decline all over the world and by 1943, it was mostly eradicated in the United States due to new medicines. Shortly after World War II, there was a short spike in cases and soldiers returning home, and they were housed at Waverly Hills. Dr. Stewart stated in his autobiography that many soldiers had advanced cases and did not live for much longer than a week after arriving there. Waverly Hills was closed down in 1961, but reopened a year later as Woodhaven Geriatric Sanitarium. Many rumors and stories were told about patient abuse and mistreatment, including unusual experiments while it was an old age home. Some were proven false, but many were sadly true. They used electroshock therapy as a treatment for many different ailments. Many budget cuts in the 60s and 70s led to horrible conditions and mistreatments, and in 1982, the state closed it for good. Is there any wonder that Waverly Hills is considered to be one of the most haunted places in the country? considering all the death, pain, and agony. The buildings and land were auctioned off many times over the next couple of decades. A developer purchased the property in 1983 with a plan of turning it into a minimum security prison for Kentucky. Neighbors protested, so they changed the idea to turn the former hospital into apartments. This idea was abandoned due to lack of financing. Robert Alberhaski bought Waverly Hills and the surrounding land in March of 1996. He ran Christ the Redeemer Foundation. He planned to build the world's tallest Jesus statue there, 
along with an art and worship center. The statue, inspired by the one in Rio de Janeiro, was meant to be placed on the roof, was priced at $4 million. More of his plan was to convert the sanatorium into a chapel, gift shop, and theater, which would have ran another $8 million. However, donations only raised $3,000 towards the project, and it was canceled in November of 1997. Albert Haskey abandoned Waverly Hills and the grounds and then tried to have the property condemned and the buildings torn down and redeveloped in order to recoup some of his costs. The county blocked this plan and it was rumored that demolition was done at the southern edge in order to undermine the structural foundations to try to claim an insurance money. This also failed and it was sold to Charlie and Tina Mattingly in 1991. They are the current owners. By 1991, the once grand building had been almost destroyed by time, the elements, and thrill-seeking vandals. It had become the local haunted house and attracted the homeless looking for shelter and teenagers breaking in looking for ghosts. It soon gained a reputation for being haunted and stories made the rounds of spirits like the little girl being seen running up and down the third floor solarium, a little boy spotted with a leather ball, a hearse appearing at the back of the building bringing coffins, a woman with bleeding wrists crying for help, and more. Visitors spoke of slamming doors, lights in the windows with no power on, strange sounds, and eerie footsteps in empty rooms. Some stories are of a man in a white coat seen walking in the kitchen and the smell of cooking food in the room. The kitchen had broken windows, fallen plaster, broken table and chairs, and debris and water from the roof leaking. The cafeteria was pretty much the same. People still claim hearing footsteps there, a door swinging shut on its own, and the smell of fresh-baked bread. The biggest and most controversial legend is connected to the fifth floor. This floor had two nurses' stations, a pantry, a linen room, medicine room, and two medium-sized rooms on both sides of the nurses' stations. One of these rooms is room 502 and is subject to many rumors, and many that broke in over the years wanted to see it. According to stories... This is where many people have seen shapes moving in the window, have heard voices, and supposedly people have jumped to their deaths. A huge misconception of the hospital was that this floor housed mentally ill tuberculosis patients. It did not. They were not insane, nor confined to their rooms. Just like on any floor, they were free to move around. Thanks to its design, patients still had access to fresh air and sunshine that was used to treat the illness. It was centered in the middle of the hospital, with the two wards extending from the nurses' stations. They were glassed in on all sides and opened into a patio-type roof. According to stories, a nurse was found dead in room 502 in 1928. She unalived herself by hanging from the light fixture. She was 29, unmarried, and pregnant. She suffered depression due to her situation, and it led to her taking her life. Nobody knows how long she hung there before being discovered. This would not be the only tragedy connected to room 502. Another nurse in 1932, she worked in the same room and jumped from the roof patio several stories to her death. Nobody knows why she did, but some believe she was pushed. There is no proof of this, but rumors persist. Those are the stories, but like many, no records are found that prove any of this. There are also conflicting reports of how the woman hung herself. Some say from the light fixture, Others say from a pipe over the door, and more say from the rafters. There isn't any rafters. The pipe is part of a sprinkler system installed in 1972, and the light fixture is hung on a chain that wouldn't hold a person's weight. While there is no documentation of either death, some say that it was verified by John Thornberry, a former staff member who died in 2006. In his obituary, it stated he was born in 1922, and he would have been 6 and 10 years old, during the alleged deaths of room 502. Because of this, his verification is extremely problematic. So what happened in room 502 that make many people claim paranormal experiences there? Was it people with overactive imaginations or something real? It's difficult to say, but something may have happened there to cause the legends to take root. No one knows what that could be, though. The story of room 502 were possibly based on some facts long forgotten. But the truth is buried among speculation and rumor. Even with all this, strange things still get reported. Thank you for joining me. If you enjoyed this, hit that like and subscribe button and comment on this video. It definitely helps with the YouTube algorithm. 
And until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you.